For the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's Richard Skipper. Happy Monday, everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. Who or what are you celebrating today? For those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. My show is all about celebrating, celebrating life, celebrating art, celebrating artists. And we have a phenomenal artist waiting in the wings. Uh, today is National Adjust Your Chair Day. Now, I know that sounds bizarre, uh, but a lot of people have a lot of back problems. And if you are someone who sits all day at a desk, uh, it's time to adjust your chair get up, go out and do something nice, go for a walk if the weather uh, is permissible. It's not here in New York today. Uh, sorry, Natalie, it's a horrible day here in New York. Uh, it also, it is National Pay Back a Friend Day. So if there's anyone that you owe money to, today is the day to clear all of that. It's also National Black Poetry Day. Uh, so we celebrate our Black poets and the contributions that they have made to our lives for now and forevermore. But today, I am celebrating Natalie Lander. And I am so excited. Here she is. We're all in a pink background in celebration of Legally Blonde. But she is Legally Brunette. And she is about to open her show at 54 Below, which we're going to talk about in a moment. Uh, Natalie, I know that you're flying to New York today. So the fact that you are here right now uh, in taking the time to spend an hour with me and our uh, friends and followers means a lot to me. Uh, besides the fact that you're about to open this show in 50, at 54 Below, um, who or what are you celebrating today? Well, oh my gosh. First of all, I want to celebrate you, Richard. You're wow. so fantastic. I love your energy. I love everything you put out in the world. It's such a wonderful it's such a wonderful thing to have people like you who celebrate. And that's something that's so important in life. Uh, and one of the things that I am currently celebrating and reminding myself to celebrate are the small things. You know, sometimes we get wrapped up in celebrating these big wins, but um, sometimes celebrating the little things is what's really important and what keeps you going. So in this moment, I'm celebrating <laughs> that I made it on time to this. <laughs> well, I thank you. Well, let's celebrate somebody big, okay? Let's start there. Okay. And that's a mutual friend of ours, uh, Mason McCauley. Um, Mason, uh, I reached out to him on his birthday, and he was telling me about your upcoming show and how excited he was about it. And uh, I said, do you think she would come on the show? And he said, I think so. He reached out, and you answered immediately. So thank you, and thank you, Mason. I love him so much. I have a lot to thank Mason for. In fact, so not only did he get me on this show with you, which is so fun, but he is the reason that I did the Legally Blonde reality show back in 2008. We're going so to talk Mason. about that in a moment. So uh, it's really all Mason's fault. <laughs> Natalie, you've had... Uh, I mean, you were born into the world of show business. Um, I asked for a photograph of you at five years of age. First of all, I love the photograph that you sent. I'm going to share this with everyone now uh, because anything with kittens in it, I am a goner. Uh, but in addition to that, your incredible father, uh, yeah. David Lander here. Uh, when you look at this picture, and you haven't changed a bit, I might add. <laughs> um, <laughs> But when you look at this picture, what are your memories of this? Well, I mean, first of all, is that the cutest cat that ever existed on planet Earth? I mean, I've never seen a kitten that looks so kitteny to me. <laughs> um, I think, sadly, that cat didn't really live very long. No. Sorry about that. No. Um, but I remember, you know, that was a time when I was really starting to discover uh, and understand kind of what my dad did for a career and a living. And I remember just thinking how cool that was and how I wanted to be just like him and do that myself. Mm -hmm. So really around age five was when I really started to discover what performing was and what it meant and all these things. Um, is your, uh, is your, what is your earliest memory of seeing your dad, uh, as an entertainer 
Uh, I don't call him a performer. He is definitely an entertainer. So I think I might have been, I'm not sure how old I was, maybe about three years old. And I don't know if I have memories of this because I've been told the story or if I actually do remember, but I was watching an episode of Laverne and Shirley. And, you know, the entrances are obviously very big deal on that show. And, of course, my dad comes through the door on TV. And now he's watching it with me. And when Squiggy goes to make his exit, he walks out the door. And I, as a three-year-old, walked behind the TV to look behind it to see if a tiny <laughs> little... I want to tell you a funny story. I had a Yorkie. Uh, named Horace Vandegelder, believe it or not. And Horace was obsessed with television. And the first time that I realized that he was obsessed with television was I was watching Cindy Adams one day and she had two Yorkies on her lap. And one of the Yorkies jumped off of her lap and ran off camera. And my dog jumped off the sofa and was behind the TV, scratching at the TV, trying to... <laughs> so this memory of you with your father reminds me of this uh, great story. Um, they basically have the intelligence of a Yorkie. No, 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 I'm not saying that at all. Uh, but uh, or my Yorkie had uh, the intelligence of a human no. being. So when you uh, first became aware of this, when did you first start exhibiting talent so that your mom and dad knew that, and your mom, Kathy, um, so that your um, mom and dad knew that you had a gift yourself and that you should be in this profession? Well, I know that, and there is video evidence of this. Uh, when I was about five years old, I played dress up in my mom's closet and did a strip tease. <laughs> and I think at that point, my parents were like, uh, we got to shape this a little bit. Um, Cause I was just kind of strutting my stuff on the runway. And I used to also be very um, clear about what I wanted from my audience of my parents. So I would say, so when you watch me do this, when you watch me do this, you have to go, oh, isn't she so good? Oh, isn't she great? So I would I would also give my audience direction too. So I think they knew early on that they were kind of doomed to have a performer child. <laughs> now, did both of your parents start out at an early age themselves in the business? So, you know, my mom grew up in the business because her father, Freddie Fields, was a very big agent. So yes. she grew up immersed. Well, let's in tell it. everybody who he was the agent for. I yes. mean, his biggest client was Judy Garland. Yes. yes, Judy Garland, Frank Sinatra, Barbara Streisand. Um, you, yeah, I mean, he was the guy. For, he was the guy. He was the guy. And so my mom grew up, you know, really immersed in a show business family. But I don't think she started acting. You know, she really started to explore acting when she was, um, like, in her 20s. Um, and then my dad, on the other hand, his parents were school teachers. And he grew up immersed in the arts just by the fact that his dad loved theater and used mm -hmm. to take my dad and his brother to theater all the time. And my dad did start performing at a very young age in camp out, out in the Catskills. And, um, and he went to the high school performing arts, which is now LaGuardia high school. LaGuardia high school. Yeah. And so he started very young um, and where my mom grew up around it in a different way. And then, started she started as a professional and did you know two movies right off the bat as leads and then decided that it wasn't for her and she became an on-set photographer for many years and was always involved in the show business world but in just different capacities i always love the fact that when someone says it wasn't for me and they're smart enough to know so and they switch i mean sometimes the business is telling you that you're not right for the business which is not the case in your uh, family's uh case, but uh, the fact that your mom knew that it was time to shift in her mm -hmm. own uh, profession. So getting back to you for a moment. So once you start exhibiting this, both of your parents who have had lifetimes in the business, uh, were they open to the fact that you really wanted to pursue this as a career? Definitely. They, they, um, they definitely always nurtured and encouraged me to study and pursue it. Um, they did have very strong 
uh, opinions and boundaries on me being a child actor. So, you know, being a Disney or Nickelodeon star was not on the table <laughs> at the time mm -hmm. for me. So, but I got to do other professional things. So I did, I started doing voiceover when I was nine years old um, because that was a way for me to get a taste of professionalism and professional acting jobs, but it didn't really take away from school. Um, I also did my first equity theater production at 17. So I still got what, what to- What was the show that got you your equity card? I always have to ask that question. So I so I didn't actually get it on this show, but I was, um, because I was one of the non-equity contracts, but it was like, the, you know, the three leads get it. So that was, but it was an equity production. So that was um, Fiddler on the Roof. And I played Hava okay. at 17. And then my first equity production that I, that got me my equity card or got me eligible, and then I joined, I think it was, was a production of Thumbelina at the Gary Marshall Theater um, out in Toluca Lake in Los Angeles. And ironically, full circle moment, I then debuted my one woman show at the Gary Marshall in August. So kind of a fun, and obviously I have a Gary Marshall connection because of Absolutely, dad. Gary Marshall. I'm thinking of all the synchronicity that's going on. Um, yeah. So you have had the great opportunity. I mean, you're a singer, you're an actress, uh, you have a one woman show. Uh, is it one particular area of the business that you really gravitate towards the most? I mean, I love theater. I love, um, I love performing for an audience. You know, there's just nothing really like getting that feedback, you know. Um, but I also love TV and film. I um, I think like a dream world for me would be a sitcom because with a live audience because it sort of, you know, is both things. Plus, obviously, that's what my dad did for so long. And that to me is the end all be all. Um, but I mean, really, I gravitate towards comedy. So comedy in sort of any capacity is where I feel um, like I thrive. So I want to talk about uh, Legally Blonde, uh, the <laughs> reality show. Uh, first of all, you mentioned Mason earlier. Uh, how did it come about that you ended up getting on this? And I want to talk about the world of reality television. Okay, yeah. So basically, um, I had graduated Pepperdine. That's how Mason and I met. We met in college, and he was my roommate for three years. Oh, wow. Yeah, and... Um, I also don't want to brag, but I was his first friend at Pepperdine because uh, he transferred in as a sophomore. And so I was his first friend. Um, and so he actually was working at the school in the theater department after we graduated. And I guess MTV had sent the theater department this sort of open call casting notice for the reality show and asking them to send it to their young, you know, female identifying students at the time. And so Mason sent it to me and was like, you should do this. And I, and the audition was the next day. And I was like, Ugh, I don't know. I don't think I can do it. He's like, you have to, you have to. And, and obviously, you know, Mason and anyone who knows Mason, he has this great, like, it, it's not an, it's, it's like an intensity, but it's like a very encouraging intensity where he's like, no, you have to do it. And I'm like, okay, I'll do it. So I went the next morning completely, you know, not necessarily prepared for anything. Uh, I went to the open call. I got there at like six in the morning and I got online. I think I was like third in line um, because, you know, in LA open calls, like they don't take them I think, as seriously as they do in New York. Um, so I just, I was like the third person in line. And well, let me I, back up for just a moment before you get there. Um, did you, I mean, were you familiar with the musical of Legally Blonde and going into this audition, what exactly were they asking you to do? I know that the premise of the show would, would be they were looking for a replacement for Laura Bundy. Um, mm -hmm. So did you know any more than that in terms of your audition? So I knew that it was, yeah, I knew it was a reality show. I knew that if I got on the show, I would be living in New York in like a group situation with the other contestants. Um, as far as the initial audition, 
the first one was just, I think, two contrasting, 16 bars of two contrasting songs. I think I sang a portion of Gimme Gimme from Thoroughly Modern Millie. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember what my ballad would have been. Now, excuse me again, but when you auditioned, did you audition as if you were auditioning for Legally Blonde? Or was there a different uh, layer to this since it was a reality-based show? So yeah, there were a couple layers. So it was sort of two things simultaneously. So actually the audition process before I even got, knew I was gonna go to New York, took place over a couple weeks. Um, So I kept getting called back and and, you know, re-interviewed. So I feel like the first day was, you know, just the initial, you know, singing songs and maybe like a small interview portion and then it was later in the day, they were like, here's some sides, can you cold read? And then it was, can you sing this song from Legally Blonde? And then it was like, can you learn this dance? And I kept getting called back, uh, like the next day would be like a new set of sort of things. Um, so I feel like it was the second day where it was more focused on actual L Woods, Legally Blonde stuff. But I was interviewed, um, because they want to see, you know, what kind of reality TV story you have. So they interviewed me all about, you know, my upbringing, my family, where I came from, all these things, my dreams, my goals. And, you know, they, you know, try to fi- figure out if you're going to be kind of dramatic and all these things. Um, and so there was that whole reality aspect of it and everything was filmed. So it was different than like a regular audition where, you know, audition processes are pretty private. This one was like you you signed all these waivers saying, you know, if it goes on TV, you know, you've no you can't be mad about it. So that was that, yeah. So from the time that you first auditioned until you found out that you were gonna be a part of this, um, what was the timeline? So it was about it was definitely um over a month. I had auditioned for my first audition was in January of 2008. Um, and then I didn't leave for New York until um, the end of February of 2008. So it was about a month, about almost two months actually, because they would keep bringing you back and then I'd have phone call interviews or then they'd be like, I had to go through a lot of like psych evaluation and like physical exams all these steps to get approved to be sent to New York to be on the next round of, of, of competition, Mm -hmm. which was just the top 20 of us. So then we all came, so 20 of us all came to New York and then competed, went through a whole other audition process to be in the top 10 that actually lived in the house. So when I left for New York from LA, you know, they told me on the phone, they were like, well, you have to prepare to either be here for, you know, the next three and a half weeks or three days. So I didn't know if I was going to get sent home right away or if I was going to stay the whole time. I want to ask about that uh, because, I mean, when you go into any show, you audition, you get cast, uh, and the show goes on the road, uh, you are definitely going out of town. Uh, But what does this do for you psychologically, not knowing whether or not, how do you plan your life out, not knowing if it's gonna be three and a half weeks or three days? What's the psychological aspects that uh, you bring to the table with that? Yeah, it, it was it was really difficult because at the time, you know, I was 24. I, you know, I was, my priorities were really different. Like I had a different life. So I was a waitress at a restaurant here in LA and it was like a really, you know, a coveted serving job that I had. And I didn't, I couldn't afford that if I got all my shifts covered for three weeks and then I had to come back after three days, I couldn't afford to not work for three weeks. So I remember actually on the phone, like sort of trying to gauge from the producers what the likelihood of me staying and you know they couldn't really tell me yes or no but i mean i think they had to have an idea of who they wanted you know they'll they'll never confirm that for me but i kind of feel like they kind of it was a puzzle that they knew was going to fit together a certain way and like unless something went horribly wrong i'm sure there were variables like 
where I might not have made it into the top 10. But I think they kind of knew I was on the trajectory to make it in. So I remember on the phone, I was like, yeah, I mean, I just, I don't know what to do. I don't know if I want to get all my shifts covered. And the producer just sternly kind of was like, just get them covered. And I'm like, okay. And so, you know, I kind of took that as my sign of I'm going to make it into the house. And who knows, maybe that was just mind over matter or whatnot. Well, I mean, uh, I, I, in your press, uh, notes it says that this show that you're doing is based on your journal entries um were you always a writer or did the writing come as a result of you uh of this journey that you are now on um you know i think i always was a writer but didn't really know it <laughs> um and so you know i always wrote like fun little like sketches and short films and things like that like i was always very creative like that and my journal specifically, I never actually really kept a journal strictly until that point. And I, I, um, I just knew at the time I needed to keep a record of what was going on because I knew I was in such a unique experience that I wanted to rem have a rem be able to look back and remember what how I was feeling and what was going on. And I actually had forgotten that I even had this journal until about four years ago when we were moving and I found it and I was like, what is this? And I opened it and I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so what it was, was pretty like going back and reading something from four years ago and that, uh, that whole journey. I mean, now you're uh, looking, you're stepping back, looking back. Uh, were there things that you did not even realize about yourself at the time that you're now seeing about yourself? Yeah, you know, I think what I really realized was, I mean, my biggest takeaway from the whole thing is how unsure I was about myself and my abilities at the time. And, you know, I was really trying so hard to convince myself that I could do it, but you could, in my writing, you could really feel the doubt that I had in myself. And you know, I kind of read it and was like, oh, poor Natalie, <laughs> like, you know, I was so, you know, nervous the whole time when now looking back, I go, what was I so worried about? You know, the, but the stakes are really high. You know, you're kind of being fed from the producer side of things, from the t reality TV side, you're being fed this narrative that if you don't get this, you're career is over. You know, it's very life or death. So I kind of looked back and was like, oh my gosh, I was so poor, poor thing. I was just petrified the whole time, but I was also really trying hard to build myself up. So there's a lot of like cringy things where I'm like, whoa, I can't believe I'm even like, you know, over inflated ego stuff that I had. And it's just, you know, I clearly was young and didn't really know myself at the time, which is interesting to see. Well, it's like going through a dark tunnel. I mean, you're starting to go through this tunnel. Um, what was your thought process or what did you imagine that the next three days or three and a half weeks uh, were going to be like? Um, and how does the reality of what it actually was compare with what you were thinking it was going to be? Yeah, you know, I think I... You know, I think I sh wanted to show up and be the feel this feeling that I was like, you know, the favorite. And I remember specifically feeling like I wasn't. I didn't feel like I no one liked me, but I did feel this sense that like there were some favorites and I wasn't kind of one of them. So I had this like sort of this what I did to compensate for that was I kind of was with really, really determined to like be so good that they cannot get rid of me, you know? And so it was sort of a white knuckling feeling that I had during the whole thing where part of me kind of wishes I hadn't had that because I could have just been like, maybe a little more myself, maybe a little more relaxed, maybe enjoy but, the I mean, it, But in reality, uh, reality, um, <laughs> but in, in the reality of all this, do you think that if you had been any different, that it would have affected the way that you came across on camera 
and the whole process of this series? You know, no, I don't. I don't think, I think I would have had the same outcome. I think um, maybe the only thing I would have, would have liked would like, I look back and I watch some of the show and I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> it's so embarrassing. You know, I'm like, I kind of was a little robotic um, because I was trying so hard to be so perfect and that's kind of exhausting, you know? And now I'm like, oh, I wish I had just loosened up a little bit. But, you know, it was the choice that I made at the time because I also was savvy to the business and savvy to what reality TV can do to people. So mm -hmm. I was just very hyper aware and hypersensitive of, of trying to be this perfect, perfect, you know, person on, on camera. Were you given any advice from family members or anyone in terms of how to respond to everything that was happening around you? Because I can imagine and you must have felt like you were in a cyclone. Yeah. I mean, I was, I really tried my best to stay as neutral as possible and stay out of any drama with any of the other girls. Um, you know, they try to get you to kind of like give you, give your opinions on them. Um, and I really, and I think I stuck to that. I really did my, and I, and I honestly, like personally, genuinely liked everyone there. So I really did my best to stay as neutral as possible. Um, well, I was going to ask, were you able to form any friendships during this time frame that you were there? Yeah. Um, and to this day I'm friends with, you know, I mean, all 10 of us, if I called one on the phone and was like, Hey, like, how are you? And, you know, they would answer my call or they text me back or we get a lunch or things like that. But, um, uh, three of them I'm like particularly close with and have stayed in touch with. Um, which has been really cool. I mean, one was at my wedding and another one, you know, we lived with me and my husband for three months in LA when she was on tour. And, you know, we all just like really, we did have a really unique special bond because we were kind of put through this very bizarre, you know, process that not many people understand full, firsthand, you know? Well, I mean, the, the, all, of this, all of this is so fascinating to me uh, because uh, <laughs> this idea of what reality television is or is not, um, have your perceptions of reality television changed because of this experience? And if so, I mean, when you're looking or I, if you even watch other reality-based uh, shows, um, do you have a skewed way of looking at those shows? It's interesting. I mean... What I will say is re reality TV is real, you know, like all the emotions are real. All the feelings are real. All the, all the stuff you see is real. Is it possibly manipulated? You know, are you sort of like, kind of like, produ you know, producers telling you things, getting into your head, which makes you sort of start to like pick yourself apart and doubt yourself. You know, that, that is, that is part of it too. Um, but I feel like that's kind of also sometimes what happens like when you're doing a very dramatic, you know, film and a director has to get you there. So they kind of have to get in your head and, you know, torture you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Are you getting um, most of your advice from producers or from the director? Wait, I'm sorry, say that again? Are you getting most of the advice or the feedback from producers or the director? Mostly from the producers because they have all the field producers there that are interviewing the entire time. Um, and so that's one thing when I watch reality TV now, I am a big fan of Bachelor franchise. Okay. Uh, my husband and I, we like, we look forward to it every week. And, um, you know, when I see some of the girls or even the guys get so stuck and in their own way and self deprecating and fearful and all these things, I am. I'm like, no, don't let the producers get in your head. You're fantastic. Like, <laughs> you know, it's just like you just know that someone, it, it's like you say one thing and you're like, you know, I actually do speak about this in my show where like, you know, there was one audition where I was like feeling really good and the producer was like, oh, really? And you're like, well, yeah. And they're like, are you, are you sure? 
And then you think that they're seeing something that you're not seeing. And then you're like, wait, do you, do you know something that I don't? Well, you know, you know, and, and it's like, and then you can't help but sort of spiral into um, a pit of despair. <laughs> so from the moment that you get to New York, um, it, take us back to that first day of shooting um, and what that day was like for you. Um, you know, from start to finish. And then I want to ask, how much was actually in the can uh, before it started to air on TV? And I'm sure you signed NDAs and everything. You could not talk about the show. Um, uh, oh, did you or you did not? I'm sure I did, but... Okay. No, but I mean, when a show is, you know, is going to TV and uh, the outcome, uh, the idea is that audiences are tuning in each week to find out who this star replacement is going to be. That's right. the thought that keeps us coming back. You were, were you instructed not to talk about any of that? Yes. So, um, and it was actually kind of fun to have the secret because people wanted to know. So I enjoyed the process of keeping the secret. I also had viewing parties every week at my house and like all my friends would come over and we watch. The thing was though, is I made it, to a point where I, they gave me a makeover. So I came back to LA with bleach blonde hair and they didn't have me dye it back. And I remember asking them like, should I dye it back brown so no one knows how far I made it? And no one really thought it through and they were like, no, keep it blonde. So then I did, but then I come home to LA and everyone's like, something happened like you know like every, everyone's like everyone thinks I won at that point because I come back and I'm so blonde um spoiler I didn't win obviously well, <laughs> but, yeah, um, don't see the show everybody it's it's yes so yeah so basically I come back with this bleach blonde hair so there were certain secrets I couldn't quite keep because everyone knew that I obviously made it to a certain point but I definitely kept who the winner was a secret and uh, actually, the night I got eliminated, I mean, I think my mom, I think my mom knew because obviously I called her when I got kicked off the show. But um, when I came, uh, when it was the episode we got eliminated, I got eliminated on and I had a huge party and no one knew. And actually my friend, a, a family friend of ours, his five-year-old daughter, who was very, very big fan of Legally Blonde at the time, she came and she... <laughs> So she's there watching the episode and she's with me and she's so excited. And then I kick, get kicked off and she starts sobbing and like is so upset. And we're like trying to console her. I felt horrible because to her, she thought like, I'll never be allowed to act again because I got kicked off that show. <laughs> How many weeks or uh, were you into the show when you were eliminated? So I made it to the top five and our episodes were not really like one elimination per episode. So I made it to, there was eight episodes and I made it to the seventh episode because like the last, ep no, no, sorry. The sixth episode, I think, no, the seventh, I don't know. It doesn't really matter, but somewhere in there. Um, but the way the show filmed by the time I was eliminated, we only had about four days left of production for them to film the last two episodes. Mm -hmm. So I just was sequestered in a hotel, actually in the same hotel we were living in. I was just like two floors below um, for the four days because they brought us all back for the finale episode. Um, so I didn't, I didn't go back to LA and then fly back. Some girl, one girl did go back because she got eliminated earlier. Mm -hmm went home for two weeks and then they brought her back. So did you have any idea that you were going to be eliminated or was it solely on camera that you found out? It was solely on camera that I found out. Um, it was pretty shocking for me because I, it, my per progress in the show, I had, we had these challenges. And so I won two challenges in a row and then also for this audition, I was like called first on the list and that was like a really big deal. So I was actually, and I was blonde at that point. So I was actually at the highest point and I had never been in the bottom, 
where other girls had been in the bottom a couple times mm -hmm. and had to go to the casting office. So I had never been to the casting office. I'd never been in the bottom. I was at the highest point of my, you know, pursuit in the competition and I got eliminated. Spoiler. Sorry. <laughs> but, um, and it was pretty devastating because, you know, I think I was really sort of shocked that it wasn't like three strikes are out. It was like one strike, you're done. And I was like pretty, pretty shocked by that element being eliminated. Well, I want to ask about this. I mean, in this business, I mean, we all lose roles and things that we go after. Um, and it's pretty much a private event unless you share it with your friends. Um, I'm one, I don't talk about upcoming projects until it actually happening. Uh, mm -hmm. That's my own rule because why, you know, let everybody know that, you know, this happened. But in your case, here you are um, on camera um, having to experience this on a huge public platform. What got you through that? Well, you know, I think I really did have this feeling that whether I, I didn't know what it would be, but I felt like this show, I really felt like this show was the job, was the gig. And the bonus would have been winning or getting, uh, you know, another job directly out of it. But I really did look at it as like, at that time I was like, this was the job. I booked this job and I, this is as far as my episode arc went and you know, that was kind of what it was. And I felt like I did my job and I knew that there would be other things, you know, down the pipeline for me. So. Well, speaking of down the pike, how did your life change from once these episodes started to air and you're part of this major series on MTV? Yeah. You know, it actually was interesting. It didn't really, um, it, it really wasn't, you know, the way I left the show was I thought this was going to be the launch, right? Um, and it really actually, it really wasn't. Um, it was at a weird time where social media wasn't quite a thing yet. It was in mm -hmm. 2008. And so it was right before like the boom of Twitter and all these things. So it was sort of like this strange, like in between phase where it didn't necessarily like launch my career into this next level. Um, if anything, you know, it, I did get recognized. And to this day, people are always like, I feel like I know you. And I'm like, I look at how old they are. And I'm like, you probably watched this reality show, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, but other than that, like, it's interesting. It didn't like do anything. It didn't really do anything, but it didn't do nothing. It didn't like do anything bad, which I think was my biggest fear was that it was going to taint me as this, like, all of a sudden I was this only known for reality TV. So in that sense, it was a success because it, it didn't hurt me in any way, shape, or form, you know? Right. I want to move forward. Um, so four years ago, you discovered these journals that you had been keeping through this. Um, when did the seed go off that this is a one-woman show? I want, to I want to put this story on stage. You know, when I found those journals, it was kind of right away that I thought, I have to do something with these and I don't know what it is. And, you know, I had always been sort of like, people had always told me, oh, you should do some kind of one person show, not necessarily based on the Legally Blonde thing, but like based on something in my life. And I'm like, eh, like, I don't know. Like I could never really find my hook. And then when I found these journals and I read them and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so silly. Um, it, it was sort of like this, snowball effect where like I started to I transcribed all the journals and then as I was doing that it really sparked a lot of um, memories I had from the show that weren't necessarily in the journals and then when I started to think about you know my journey on the show and my personal arc on the reality show and the music from Legally Blonde I was like these work this works so well and like I felt like it had just this natural emotional arc to it so it was really once I started putting the pieces together, it came together very effortlessly, I felt. So once you've got the story, uh, you begin to put a team together. 
Um, how did you go about choosing your director, your musical director, and the people that are part of the uh, Natalie Lander story? Yeah. So basically, my director named Matthew Leffitt, he actually, and I worked together, he's a writer, and we worked together on a play he did um, right before the pandemic. And we were made friends during, you know, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And one day we got together for lunch, and actually his dad was a writer on Laverne and Shirley. So we have a lot of like family connections, even though we never knew each other growing up. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of like interesting crossover. And he came to me because he it has a theater company, loves to produce theater, loves to write, loves to direct, and was like, you know, this pandemic, I don't really know what's going on with it, but I think, you know, one person shows will, will be the easiest to put up because you don't have to worry about a cast. And he said, you know, do you have anything or do you want to write something? And I was like, well, you know, it's funny. I was, I've been kind of playing around with this thing and I, I'm not really sure. And it's a first draft and it's really bad. And do you want to read it? And he was like, yeah. So he read it and he was like, I love this. I want to work with you on it. So we basically for a full year developed the script together. And I went to his house every week. And basically what we would do is I would give him a journal entry and tell, you know, or tell him what I wrote. And then he would ask me questions about it and like ask me how I was feeling other things and it would spark other memories. And then I'd be like, oh my gosh, that reminds me of this thing that happened. And then I'd go away for a week and I'd write, rewrite it. And then I'd come back and I'd be like, okay, how, this is what I have now. And so then we, that's how we did it. And we, <coughs> excuse me. You're excuse, Yeah. Yeah. And so then we just came back and, and that's how we did it for a full year. And it was just kind of like me refining it, refining it, refining it, refining it until it got to this place. And and then my music director um, in LA, who unfortunately won't be able to join me in New York because um, he's working on something else. He, um, his name is Michael Sobe, and I came to him and I was like, hey, so I, um, I'm doing this thing. I butchered all the Legally Blonde songs can you make sense out of this? <laughs> and he was like, <laughs> sure. And because um, I sing all the songs from Legally Blonde the Musical, but with parody lyrics. So I've rewritten the lyrics to match my journey and my story. Um, and they're all cut and like cuckoo. And they have, you know, they start and they stop and they have monologues in the middle and it's kind of, you know, a crazy thing, but he made sense of it. And um, yeah, and it was great. And then my producer in New York, her name is um, Jen Sandler. She actually was the one who came to me last year and was like, would you ever want to do a one woman show at 54 Below? And I was like, why do you say that? I have this thing that I'm working on. And so that was kind of how that happened. And then that inspired me to go to my friend Joe Blary over at the Gary Marshall. And I was like, when 54 Below wanted to do it, I was like, well, I can't not do it in LA. So I went to him and I was like, I have this weird show. And I actually just wanted to test it at the theater. Like, could I just do like a workshop of it at the theater? And he got super excited about it and took it to this whole other level at the Gary Marshall Theater and made it a full theater production. And they built me a set and, um, and then it became what it, is and now i'm taking it to new york this week and so yeah oh, it all just really came together very easily which was that's how i felt like i knew it was the right thing to do when everything was the pieces were just kind of happening well i mean hopefully this is going to lead to longer runs uh everything each day um on the show uh i choose a word of the day okay. and the word i chose today is excellence because that's what you exude for me uh, excellence in terms of your process, in terms of the work that you do and everything. If anyone uh, responds uh, with excellence, uh, hashtag excellence, uh, you'll win today's uh, giveaway, which is a surprise. I'm not going to tell anyone what it is. Uh, you'll just get it in the mail. Uh, so anyway, I want, uh, I've got some uh, random uh, wind down questions that I'm going to okay. ask you uh, just for fun, uh, just to give everyone a bigger sense of who, who you are and what you're all about. Uh, the first three questions are totally random because I haven't even looked at them yet. And oh, the okay. first question is, 
uh, what's the best job that you've ever had in this business besides what we're talking about? That's so hard because I really loved all my jobs that I've had. Um, I've been so lucky that like the roles that I've gotten in all different capacities, I, I always, it's very rare that I have a bad experience. Um, but I will say like a big highlight um, was I got to, I was a series regular on a Disney junior cartoon called Goldie and Bear. And I got to, and I played the voice of Goldie. And I got to sing like all these great songs on the show. And they had such like a Disney quality to them that, you know, to be a Disney character was like so cool. And I also got to, um, my dad did an episode and we got to record together in the booth. And that was definitely a highlight of of my career and something I'm very, very, very proud of and a show that I really love and miss. That's wonderful. Uh, next, uh, it's actually a uh, statement. Uh, it says, say no to something you, do, you don't want to do. Uh, I'm gonna rephrase this a moment. Have you ever said um, no to something in the business that you later regretted? Uh, and have you ever said yes to a job and you don't have to give away the details, that you later regretted? Um, I will say I've definitely said no to things and I, I'm i usually pretty clear on where my boundaries are. Mm -hmm. And and so, no, I don't have regrets on that. Good. I'm glad <laughs> um, to hear that. Yeah, because I just really do, um, I feel like I know what feels right to me and I really trust my instinct on that. It's actually been very, very rare. I'm pretty much a yes person. Um, I'm kind of a yes, like throw anything at me. I'm game for anything. Um, will I say it if I said yes to something that I regretted? No, because you know what? Even something that like the worst thing I ever did or whatever it was, I still have like a funny, funny stories that have come out of all those experiences. So I never regret that because at least I have um, fun thing, you know, fun stories to tell at parties. <laughs> That's great. Now this card is called a new card. Uh, I don't even know what I'm gonna read here, but I'm gonna use this and then I'm going to uh, find a way to make this work for you. It says, yeah. use the word new to create excitement and interest. Uh, for example, this is a completely new idea. So uh, novelty is found to be one of the most appealing qualities for the mind of a modern human. Uh, by merely calling something new, it's being perceived as better, whether it's an idea or smartphone. Um, you're doing this show at 54 Below. What makes this show newer, other than the fact that new dates, than what you did in LA? Yeah, well, I think what's going to be exciting is I'll have a new audience with a whole new perspective because, you know, I think a New York audience will appreciate it. Not that an LA audience didn't appreciate it, but I think a New York audience will appreciate the musical theater Broadway audition process from a whole other perspective than mm -hmm. what my LA audience necessarily had. So I'm very excited to get um, their new perspective. And you're really around the corner from, was it the Palace Theater where Legally Blonde was? Yeah. Yes, so you're literally right around the corner from uh, where uh, the Palace Theater, uh, where Legally Blonde originally began. So what is the hardest decision that you have ever had to make in your career? Oh, uh, you know, I think, gosh, I feel like one of the hardest ones was actually right when I finished the show, uh, the Legally Blonde show was deciding if I w wanted to move to New York or not. Um, and that, that's still one that I kind of grapple with mm -hmm. to this day. Um, but I did, choose, you know, I chose to stay in LA and, you know, try to, you know, maybe see what being bi-coastal is, which I mean, I haven't really done that. But uh, thankfully my husband is actually born and raised in Manhattan. And so we get to visit a lot. So now a New York sort of life is, you know, kind of, I think more in the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. But um, that, was, that was really hard. I definitely went back and forth on that. And I ultimately decided 
I didn't want to struggle in New York that I rather <laughs> try to struggle in LA. <laughs> <laughs> Struggle is struggle. I mean, it may be a little different in New York. I, you know, being here in New York, I love New York. Um, what one thing do you wish you that you had done differently in your career, if anything? You know, I think, I mean, look, I, I feel like everything leads you to this moment in life. And so, you know, I'm happy, you know, I all the decisions I made have led me here and it's the right timing for me. I think looking back, if I were to give myself any, you know, younger Natalie advice, actually, it would be to actually cultivate my talents um, and nurture my talents as a as a creator sooner and not be so afraid of that. I think I was really intimidated by writing and creating my own work because I didn't really know if I was good enough, you know, or if I even deserved that kind of title of of whatever I thought it was at the time, power or things like that. And now I'm like, no, it's actually, you know, feels like a place that I feel like I really enjoy and fit naturally and, and sort of wish I had, I had leaned into that a little sooner. But, you know, every I wasn't ready to tell any of these stories until now. So. Well, timing is everything. Now is the time. Um, yeah. What was your biggest find working on this show in terms of uh, some... Uh, a an aha moment that happened for you, Natalie Lander, doing this show? You know, I think something I didn't realize was I was still carrying around a lot of emotion from the show uh, 14 years later. Wow. And I didn't necessarily realize that until I started working on it and it, it brought up a lot of feelings for me. And so I think the biggest aha was finding that and being able to reconcile it and let it go finally and make peace with the process and turn it into, you know, now I have this new story of, of Legally Blonde instead of my old narrative, which was I didn't, I didn't get it. I got kicked off. I never did the show. I never did the this, whatever it was. I never got to play Elle Woods ever. And now it's like, no, I have this new story. I took this thing and I, and I made a new experience out of it. And how cool is that? So I love it. I, yeah. I, absolutely. I'm writing a, a one man show as well. So uh, I, and I know the process. I've done this before and uh, it's a lot of work. And so kudos to you and what you're doing. Um, what's the, I'm going to, uh, what's the cost to your career? by remaining where you are. Uh, you mentioned a few moments ago that you grapple about whether or not to move to New York or anything. Are there any drawbacks to remaining in LA? Or, um, I mean, we live in a world now where, thank God, you can travel back and forth. But are there any drawbacks to remaining where you are rather than making the move? I don't think so anymore. You know, I think I used to think that. I used to go, what if, a lot. But I feel like, you know, for me, LA is my home. Um, I have my family here. I have my network of friends here. I have my network of everything here. Um, so I feel like, you know, I really made the choice to stay in and put down roots and, and commit to this LA lifestyle. And I know that New York will always be there. And if I ever decide to go, like I can go and that, and actually now that things are on tape, you know, I really can, be here in LA and audition for things in New York. And if something brought me there, then, you know, we would go with bells on. That's wonderful. Um, now you mentioned that you recently got married. Is your husband in the business? Yeah. So we met as um, actors together in a play and it was a showmance. And um, okay. that was 13 years ago. Congratulations. And then That's good. Yeah, thank you. And we got married five years ago, and uh, Jared is his name, Jared Hillman. He has since transitioned away from acting, and he is now a director and a writer, and he actually directs a lot of commercials and specifically a lot of uh, kids' content and things like that. So he's got a great niche he's found. He works for companies like Mattel, which is really cool, and I mean, he gets to play with toys all day, so. That's <laughs> wonderful. Doing 
So as I mentioned, uh, the word of the day is excellence. I see that we've only gotten four people who have commented with hashtag excellence, uh, but uh, a few more, I'm gonna ask a couple of more questions just to give people a chance to do so, uh, so that you'll get a fabulous prize in the mail. Um, so uh, we've we talked about where you've been to get to this point. You're about to fly to New York. How long will you be in New York? I will be there for a full week. So just a week. Um, this time. So I come, I get in like late tonight, you know, or late to early Tuesday morning. And it's kind of a red eye thing. It's like, I get in at 1am. So it's like, Jared and I are calling it the pink eye, which we don't want pink eye, but <laughs> no, no, I know what you mean. So I uh, definitely not get pink eye. Yeah, so, no. Um, what is the biggest truth that you feel that you've experienced in your career? I think the biggest truth is um, that I feel like if 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 I am my own, you know, north star essentially, and follow my own instinct and intuition on all these things, that there's no wrong decisions, and you know, I feel like as long as I, you know, know who I am and I stay grounded and I'm grateful for, you know, celebrate the little things that uh, I'll always be on the right path. Now, we have a comment from one of our viewers. I'm going to read the oh. comment. And it says, this is such a great interview. Thank you. Natalie is wonderful as always. And Richard, you are uh, an amazing interviewer. And that's Kathy Fields Lander. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Kathy, for being here. Kathy, come on the show. I'd love to have Kathy on the show. Oh um, yeah, she's got stories. Oh, I want I, Kathy. Mm -hmm. uh, contact me. Uh, you know, Natalie will tell you how. Um, I'll correct you. Now, I'm gonna. And this is gonna be a strange question. Um, what true crime uh, have you been most tempted to commit in your <laughs> career? <laughs> oh my god. Well, you know. <laughs> Sometimes you might want to, you know, off someone for a role. No, I'm kidding. Um, what true crime? Oh, my gosh. I mean, oh, let's see. Gosh, I would think, like, the worst thing I'd ever want to do is, like, steal a purse from, like, Chanel. <laughs> now, I'm going to ask you this question. And, Kathy, since you're here, you can answer as well. Uh, when you were a child, and we've already seen this adorable photograph of you, um, did you fit the mold of a perfect child? I, oh, well, I, my mom can answer that. <laughs> uh, I, think I think you were. I think you are. I think you're perfect good. as you are. I think I was a good kid because I had good parents. So, you know, I learned from them. That's wonderful. So we're going to do a giveaway right now. Uh, and uh, thank you all for being here. Don't go anywhere for a moment. Uh, Thank you all for being here today. And uh, Kathy, thank you for being here as well. It's great to see you. And uh, uh, Sherry Callahan from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. She's on a roll. She wins a lot, but she shows up. So uh, Sherry, I will get your prize out to you. Um, I want to thank you so much for being here, especially on a day. What time are you flying today? 5 p.m. So it's 10 a.m. here. So I have a nice, uh, we're leaving it like for the airport around like 3 Okay, we'll travel safely, and uh, if I can get there, I'm going to be uh, there cheering you on as well. I can't wait to see the show. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here today. As I said, the word of the day is excellence. I'm going to change the scroll here at the bottom. Uh, if anyone uh, is able to uh, purchase tickets, the information is right there. Go to 54 Below's website, and it's very easy to purchase tickets. Uh, you know, it's all about there. And as wonderful as Natalie is, she's even more wonderful when there's a full appreciative audience uh, in the house. And that's why I want to say to all of you, um, and I know that I can speak for Natalie when I say this, um, in this business, we don't take it lightly when you show up. And the fact that you spend an hour with us, uh, the show obviously is earlier today. We did it earlier because Natalie is flying this evening. Uh, and uh, the normal time that I would be doing the show, she's going to be flying on her Pink Eye Express uh, right across the country. You'll see that pink cloud of uh, uh, smoke behind the plane as she's on her way to New York for a very successful 
uh, run here. I know it will be. So thank you all for being here. Uh, as you all know, I always end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything return. Uh, go to your Facebook friends list. Uh, Natalie, are you on Facebook at all? Yes, I am. Yes. Well, you do the same thing. Go to your Facebook friends list and the sixth name that pops up, reach out with a phone call. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message, a phone call. And let that person know what they mean to you. Let them know about this show. Um, leave a comment uh, on the uh, YouTube after today's show. Uh, share this with your friends. Let other people know about these upcoming performances. Um, and uh, as my dear friend Sean Moniker always says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And as you all know, I always say, if you're going to go out in a boat, make sure you bring a skipper along. So I'm going to leave the screen, Natalie, and I'm going to give you the final word. Uh, it can be about anything that we talked about today that you want to build upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any final message you want to give for everyone who's watching right now. I thank you for your uh, role in excellence in this business. Keep doing what you're doing. You are really a great guest. And I hope that anytime you have anything to talk about, that you'll keep me on your list and that you'll come back and do the show again. Uh, so it's all yours and don't worry about how to end the show. As soon as you say goodbye, the final credits will roll. So Aww. it's all yours. Thank you for being here today. Well, thank you. Well, no pressure at all. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say, uh, Richard, you are a beacon of excellence and I feel like this show is such an uplifting, wonderful thing and we're all better people for being in your world. And um, I guess the one thing I want to say is, let's just clarify, I hope I don't get pink eye on my flight. Uh, <laughs> we'll keep it pink eye free, but it will be a beautiful pink flight. And I just want to thank everyone um, for their generosity and their time and coming to listen. And um, I hope everyone has a wonderful day and life. Yay. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> 